Hello, and welcome to Public Service Announcement with me, your host, Dr. James E.K. Hildreth. This episode is unlike any other episode this season, as I'll be interviewed by guest host Marcus Whitney, who leads Jumpstart Nova, the first healthcare venture fund in America focused on Black-founded and led startups. This episode takes you through my journey becoming a researcher, physician, and current president and CEO of one of the nation's four HBCU Academic Health Science Centers, Meharry Medical College. I hope you enjoy hearing about my experience navigating childhood, higher education, and healthcare as a black man. Before I jump in, I just want to say that I certainly share something with many people in Nashville who lived through the pandemic here, which is uh, a, a tremendous amount of pride and gratitude for the contributions that Dr. Hildreth made, not only for our city, uh, and he certainly did alongside of his many colleagues at Meharry Medical College in making sure that our citizens had access to vaccines in a time when we really needed them most, but also in leadership, communicating the realities of a pandemic, uh, infectious diseases, as someone who truly could be respected and, and trusted in a moment such as that. So it was amazing to have him doing that right here in Nashville, Tennessee for the entire country. And I uh, just want to say, Dr. Hildreth, thank you for that. That's very kind. Appreciate it. And so with that, let's jump in. Can you please tell us where you are from, who raised you, <laughs> and how you were raised? Sure. So I'm from a small town in Arkansas, Camden. When I was growing up, there were about 14,000 people who lived in Camden. Um, I kind of lived in a village because my mother, Lucy, Lucy May Hildreth, her sister lived right next door to her, to us, and right down the street was the first cousin. We were children growing up together. My mother had seven children. Her sister, uh, Tommy Lee, had six and right down the road was Miss Faye, and she had several kids of her own. So we had this little village thing going on. We had all had multiple moms, and we knew that if something happened, my mother would find out about it because that's the village we lived in. And my mother never really made it past the eighth grade, but she was really a brilliant woman and a person of faith. The thing that amazed me the most was my mother's grace, how she treated everybody, no matter who you were. Uh, she treated them with the same compassion and embracing them and showing them love, which is one of the gifts I think she gave me. That's powerful. Looking at your academic roadmap, coming from where you grew up and having a mother who never made it past the eighth grade, you have, and it's I think it's objectively true, an elite academic roadmap. Harvard University, a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford, Johns Hopkins. Talk about the beginning of, of that and maybe help us to understand how did you evolve and change to the point where sure. you became a Rhodes Scholar? Sure. Um, honestly, when I was uh, growing up, I became interested in science and, you know, scientific things quite early. I think I was about seven or eight years old when I realized I loved learning and learning about the natural world around me. And that all sort of changed when my father got really sick. Um, and he died when I was 11 years old. And we have a hospital there in Camden, Washita County Hospital. Camden was the county seat, and there was a hospital there. And I could never quite understand why my father could never get the kind of care he needed. And I realized that it was because we were poor and black and lived on the wrong side of the tracks, right? So it made me angry, to be honest with you, because I just couldn't understand it, why this was happening. But deep down inside, I kind of knew what the reality was. And then uh, sometime later, Martin Luther King was assassinated, of course, and MLK had become my superhero. Had an uncle who lived in a neighboring town, Smackover, Arkansas, <laughs> and he was a preacher. And he would come to the house on certain weekends and bring uh, LPs of the recordings of MLK, and we'd sit and listen to them. Hmm. And I read about him and just come to believe that he was... Uh, an amazing human being, and of course, being black and male, I could really associate with that. So then he was taken away, and so my anger became rage, and my mother used to tell the story that for 
two or three months, I didn't say a word to another human being. I might have said something to my mother, but nothing to anybody else. And I say I thank God for a praying mother because my mother kept talking to me, praying over me, and she then challenged me that instead of being angry, son, why don't you do something about this? So I decided at age 13, I think it was, I'm going to become a doctor. But at the time, this is in the you know, late 60s, I had never seen anyone who looked like me who was a doctor, hadn't read stories, any stories about black doctors, but I decided that's what I'm going to do to make sure no other kid who was like me would lose their father like I lost mine. And uh, I did research, and the research I was doing was about medical schools, how to get into medical school, what is that like, what is the training like, et cetera. And at the time, uh, Marcus, there were news articles and books and magazines that were ranking universities as to the success of their pre-med students. In other words, if you're a pre-med at College X, what are the chances of you getting into medical school? And there was one school that was head and shoulders above all the rest. In my brain, I thought, I've got to go there because my chances are limited anyway. I better get to this place. And of course, it was Harvard. So I did everything I could do to make myself an attractive applicant to Harvard. I played sports for a while, had two jobs, superintendent of the Sunday school, Boy Scouts, all of it to try to you know make myself attractive to Harvard. And sure enough, in April of 1975, I got a letter from Cambridge informing me that I'd been accepted to Harvard with a scholarship. The truth is I applied to all the Ivy League schools and to Stanford and a few others, and they all gave me an acceptance. But since my research said Harvard, that's where I went. And then uh, when I arrived in Harvard in the fall of 75, there were 1,600 students in the freshman class, and about 120 of us, I believe that's the right number, were black. And we kind of bonded together because we all felt, to some extent, like we were imposters, right? And in most of the dining halls, if you went into the dining halls at dinner time, you would see there was something called a black table because most of the African-American students were sitting together. And I had six colleagues that I went through Harvard with, uh, and we did all kinds of things together. And then one night in, in uh, 1978, I think it was October the 30th or something like that, we're talking about our aspirations, what we wanted to do. One of my sweet mates and running mates, uh, Michael Whitfield Jones from Bangor, Maine, said, you should apply for the roads. And I said, okay. But then another one of my colleagues had already applied for the roads, told me it's going to be challenging because you have to have a postmarked application November 1st with letters from professors, a letter from a president or a dean. And I thought the chance of me getting that deans and professors to sign letters in a day were going to be impossible. But another one of my sweet mates worked at the post office, and he went to the post office, took a large envelope, postmarked it <laughs> October 31st. I sent my application in on November the 3rd and I guess something like that, and God must have been in it because I was selected as the first black road scholar from Arkansas and uh, went off to Oxford and had a great experience there. And normally you only get two years of support at Oxford, but my time at Harvard had convinced me that research was going to be part of my future. So uh, there were two renowned immunologists at, at Oxford. I wanted to be a PhD student with them, but you can't do a PhD in two years. So I had to lobby, cajole, do a sit-in to get the Rhodes people to give me some extra years of support. So I was one of the first Rhodes Scholars to get more than two years of support. And I did my PhD in immunology at Oxford and uh, then returned to uh, the States to do medical school at Johns Hopkins. The way I ended up going to Johns Hopkins was really my wife was pregnant with our first child, Sophia, and she was going to be born the first week of medical school. So during my last you know, months at, at Oxford, I wrote a letter to the dean of students at Harvard and Johns Hopkins, my two top schools. Oglesby Paul was the dean of students at Harvard. Henry Seidel was the dean of students at Johns Hopkins. I wrote them a letter to say, my wife is pregnant. We're going to have a baby. How am I going to pay for this? Can you help me deal with this? So I swear to God that from Harvard, I got a letter in the mail 
with a brochure inside, circled in red, the cost of having obstetric care. Oh, okay. That was it. I was in the lab one day, and the phone rang, and someone said that it's a gentleman from Johns Hopkins calling you from Baltimore. I said, oh. So I answered the phone. It was Henry Seidel. And Henry said, uh, Dr. Seidel said, James, you just finish up your studies. Do the work you need to do. Let us worry about uh, Phyllis and the baby when the baby comes. You don't have to worry about that. We've got that covered. Now, Marcus, which of those two schools would you have chosen to go to? <laughs> that made it a very easy choice. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Yes. That, so I ended up going to Johns Hopkins just based on the fact that they seemed to be more focused on, on me as a student and not a number in a big you know, organization. And so that's kind of how this all evolved. And there were key people in my life that helped me do all of this, of course. And one story I love to tell, which is really important in all of this, is that when I was a student at Harvard, they had senior residents at the medical school serve as pre-med advisors to the undergraduates. My pre-med advisor was a lovely human being, David Moskowitz from St. Louis, Missouri. He was my pre-med advisor, one of them. He asked me to make a list of the medical schools I was going to apply to. So I made my list. There were 10 schools on my list. And David came over to the campus. We sat and met. I put my list in front of him. Without saying a word, he crossed out the top school on my list, just crossed it out. Oh. And he saw the look on my face and said, oh, no, James, you're a great student. You're going to get into a great school. But let's not bother with Johns Hopkins because they don't take black students. And he was right because in the decade leading up to my application cycle, they'd only taken one or two black students. And uh, David thought it, we should not waste the application fee on a school that was probably not going to take me. And Marcus, a few days later, I got a letter in the mail from Baltimore, Maryland, one of those fancy envelopes, you know, with the embossed letters and all that. The Division of Cardiac Surgery at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine opened the letter, and it said, Dear James, congratulations on your remarkable achievements as a student. We'd love to have you come to Johns Hopkins for medical school. Signed, Levi Watkins, Jr., M.D., Associate Professor of Cardiac Surgery. I didn't know who Levi Watkins was. All I knew was I'd gotten a letter, personal letter addressed to me, mm -hmm. saying we'd love to have you come to Johns Hopkins. So I couldn't wait to show that letter to, to Dave. David. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I said, what do you think about this? He said, well, you should probably go for it. And it turns out that Levi Watkins was the first black faculty member, clinical faculty member at Johns Hopkins, and they put him on the admissions committee. He started asking questions. Why don't we take black students? And Norm Anderson, who was the uh, director of admissions at the time, said, we'd love to take some black students. We just can't find any who are qualified. So Levi said, okay, I'll find them. So he wrote personal letters to about, I don't know, 30 of us who had done really well on the MCAT with that same message. We'd love to have you here at Johns Hopkins. And so that's really the reason why I ended up at Johns Hopkins, that along with the call from Henry Seidel. And Levi showed you what one person can do with the courage to challenge the, you know what I mean? So, yeah. And he was a great mentor uh, for me during my time at Hopkins. There are so many remarkable things embedded in that story you just told. To me, probably the most amazing is a 13-year-old boy losing his father and subsequently losing his hero. Yeah. At that time in America, a young black boy in the South Middle America, mm -hmm. and to be able to move from the disappointment, the grieving, and the rage to being accepted by every single <laughs> Ivy League school that he applied to. Well, My goodness. Well, one of the ways I sum it up is a song by Sweet Honey and the Rock. You know, there are a group of black women who sing gospel and folk songs, and one of those songs captures for me, what my mother did. And the song the song really is, I think the title is, There Were No Mirrors in My Nana's House. So I didn't know that my skin was too dark, my nose was too big, my hair was too nappy to do all these things. And so my mother took down the figurative mirrors and didn't let all those things that the external world was throwing at me become internalized because I had teachers 
who thought they were doing the right thing by me, who were encouraging me as a really bright kid to choose the right vocation, right? Electrician or plumber or whatever. But my mother was not having, not having any of it, right? The librarian, Miss Harriet Washington, played a big role because uh, she would also just give me some strong words of encouragement to keep me going. And when I graduated from high school as a valedictorian, I didn't know all the backstories about all the things that were happening in the background of trying to make sure that a black kid was not going to be a valedictorian. I think the schools in Camden integrated when I went into the ninth grade. Okay. And uh, there were a lot of people who didn't want to see the valedictorian of my class be an African-American male. But there were teachers who took some degree of risk to make sure that, that I got what I deserved. So there are lots of people who've played roles along the way, uh, some of whom I probably won't, won't even know who they are. But I do give them thanks. When you talked about the story of, of, of Levi and Johns Hopkins and the timing of that, I couldn't help but think about the fact that your path was research. And, of course, Johns Hopkins is the home of the Gila cell. Yes. And the immortal Henrietta yes. Lacks. Yes. Uh, for whom the world of modern medicine will never be able to repay her. That's right. Her. And That's right. Uh, just thinking about that happening on that same hollowed ground where you were the breakthrough student. Mm -hmm. it's just It's just a powerful sentiment. I would imagine as you were passing through... The, the halls of the University of Oxford and then into Johns Hopkins specifically, right? You weren't just doing the work so that you could advance. You also had to make sure that there was an expanded view as Absolutely. to who was being considered in this work. Absolutely. So I took it upon myself to use Levi's example to make sure that others who look like me could benefit from and, and have the excitement of being in science. Research is an amazing thing, right? I mean, uh, when I was a, a junior at, at Harvard, I had to get a job at the medical school to fill in my scholarship. And I took a job at the medical school in an immunology lab. And of all things, the assistant professor I was assigned to turned out to be from Arkansas, Michael Williams. He was white, of course. He was your stereotypical mad professor. I, I mean it. He had the horn rim glasses, his hair was all over his head. <laughs> he spoke with his hands, you know, just high, highly energetic and all this. He found out I was from Arkansas and decided I was going to become a project in a, in a really positive way. He was going to convince me that immunology was the best thing in the world. I was a chemistry major, organic, organic chemistry major, and he challenged me to do an experiment, an immunology experiment. I said, well, you know, I'm chemistry major, so what do you have in mind? So back then, in those earliest days of immunology, we were still trying to figure out how cells became activated. And Michael's hypothesis and many others was that the proteins floating in the membrane of a cell had to be brought together to be clustered. And that would send a signal to the cell that something is happening on the outside. I better respond. Mm. So he asked me to develop a chemical crosslinker, a chemical that would react with one protein, react with a neighboring protein, and bring them together. And this would cluster those molecules, and if it worked, the cells would become activated. And it became obvious very quickly that the experiment had worked. And I'm thinking to myself, I know something that has never been known before, and until I tell somebody, I'm the only human being who has ever known this. And I thought, wow. That's pretty powerful, right? So it's the first time I really understood the excitement of generating new knowledge. And Michael had convinced me that I should consider research because if you're a physician, you can help people in a profound way, one person at a time. But when you do research, you have the potential to positively affect the lives of people millions at a time. The vaccine is a great example of COVID-19. So... I decided to do an MD and a PhD. So when I got to Oxford from Harvard, I decided to do my PhD there. So that's, that's another example of a person at a key part in my, my career, my life, that had a profound impact and showed me something that otherwise I would not have ever experienced that before, but because of Michael Williams. Tell me about HIV. You know, it was the first disease where people 
in my life died from, and nobody would talk about why they had died. Mm -hmm. They just died. Yes. It was a very scary disease. Absolutely. So um, when I got back to Johns Hopkins, having done a PhD in immunology, my career plan was to become a transplant surgeon. Because if you're a transplant surgeon, you transplant an organ, your goal is to have that organ accepted and restore health to that person. But if it's coming from an individual with, with a different genetic background, the immune system sees it as foreign and will act to reject it. So immunologists are the ones who have done research, along with pathologists, to make it possible to do re transplantation without having rejection. So my plan was to become a transplant surgeon. So anyway, my first rotation at Hopkins as a medical student was internal medicine. One of my first patients that I cared for as a student was a young black woman in her early 20s. She had given birth to a baby. They were both HIV positive. And there was absolutely nothing we could do for them mm -hmm. except treat their symptoms and watch them die. And this had a profound impact on me because it was clear at the time, at least some evidence in Baltimore and other places, that this would be a disease that would be very challenging to medical researchers, to immunologists, but also could be devastating to people of color and disadvantaged people. So I prayed over it, gave some thought to it, and decided to change my career plans from transplant surgery doing HIV research and clinical services. And then, I believe it was in 1987, the first drug was developed, AZT, but the virus was actually characterized in 1983. We knew what it was. A really colorful scientist in uh, France identified the cause of HIV, and that set the research in motion about how to deal with this. Thankfully, though, now we have treatment as prevention, but uh, the silver lining of the HIV pandemic and AIDS is that it's led to some amazing discoveries in the immune system, how to develop drugs quickly, how to test them with high throughput systems and all this. So it is still a really challenging situation, but there have been some benefits to come out of it that have been beneficial in other diseases. Talk about leading higher education institutions. And uh, you, you did some remarkable work in the UC system, uh, UC Davis, and and now you've you've been here in Nashville uh, as the leader of Meharry Medical College. Talk about how you've seen that that work evolve from what you experienced when you were a student in the seventies, sure. right? You know, to today in the two thousands sure. and, and, and beyond. Well, one of the biggest changes is how much knowledge has been accumulated over the last couple of decades. The rate at which data is being accumulated, which becomes knowledge, is amazing to me. And it's on this steep incline that is impossible to even imagine how much is going to be just a short time from now. But part of my uh, story is that when I was a associate professor at Johns Hopkins, and by the way, I was the only black professor out of the hundreds of professors in basic science at the time. And I was the first African-American to become a full professor with tenure in basic sciences at, at Hopkins. My department chair volunteered me for a leadership program that the dean started because Hopkins wanted to grow its own leaders. Mm. So I got in this course, and after about the third session, it really did occur to me that leadership does matter and that things like the curriculum you put in front of a student to how you deal with the different needs of students in terms of learning styles and all this. I sort of got jazzed by it what leadership in higher education could mean. And uh, after I got through that one-year session or course that they put on, I was asked to become the first associate dean for graduate studies at Johns Hopkins Medical School. They never had a dean for the PhD students, even though there were hundreds of them. And they asked me to be the first uh, dean for the graduate students. And my focus at the time was to realize that Getting a PhD is a process by which you learn skills, critical thinking, problem solving, evaluating data, et cetera, that would be applicable not just to research, but to teaching, journalism, law, et cetera. So I set up an office to give students advice on non-traditional tracks to pursue after getting a PhD. This office became very successful. Now it caters to postdocs, assistant professors, and graduate students. So when I came to... Uh, Nashville to be the founding director of the 
HIV Research Center at Meharry. I kind of brought some of that with me, trying to make sure we had a training environment for PhD students that would be supportive and, and robust, and I think we were very successful in doing that. And then the opportunity at UC Davis to be the dean of the College of Biological Sciences, some people wondered, why would you do that as an MD, as a scientist, you know, you're training undergraduates. But what they didn't realize is that there were only two colleges in the country, the other being at Minnesota, where the focus was entirely biology. There's no art department, no English department. The only departments are biology, plant biology, cell biology, genetics, environmental sciences, et cetera. And at least 40% of those students are pre-health, pre-nursing, pre-med, pre-vet, you know, pre-dentistry. And I thought I could give them some tools and some advice and guidance about how to be successful in doing that. Not to mention that half of the students were first generation in college. Mm. So to me, I was actually able to pay it forward in, in a way mm-hmm. by being the, the, the dean for these students and trying to help them be successful in what they were doing. So part of my modus operandi is to create opportunities for students to get excited about something and possibly pursue it as their careers. Because I just love science, and I think it's the most amazing thing. I feel so blessed to be able to do what I do, so I want to share that. Let's talk about the future of science, right? I mean, I think one of the most powerful forces that has come along to exponentially accelerate science is computer science. Oh, absolutely. And... uh we're now moving into the era of AI. You're at a higher education institution. You are you're a very experienced, successful, multi patented, you know, researcher. You understand wh- yes. what we're dealing with. Yes. And I'm sure there has to be excitement and also probably some some caution as well around the power we're Absolutely. we're about to embark on. Well, I think the fact that we were able to create vaccines for COVID nineteen and SARS CoV two in literally less than a year reflects the amazing technologies that have been developed that can be brought to bear on biological problems that impact humans. So when artificial intelligence is applied to large data sets, the results are going to be astounding. I mean, there are probably going to be some discoveries made that could not possibly have been anticipated. When you have these heuristic networks that can apply logic to these large data sets, it can find answers and patterns that would be impossible for humans to see without them. And in terms of data science, one example I give people is that if you're standing in a grove of trees and all you see are trees, you don't know if you're standing in somebody's backyard or rainforest in the Amazon. What data science allows you to do is to elevate yourself high enough up to see the patterns. So these kinds of things, being able to do them with large data sets will change everything. Not to mention the molecular tools of we have for sequencing DNA, RNA, and proteins. Some of these devices are the size of thumb drives, literally, which is just, it's like Star Trek stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But it's real, yeah, right? For me to have spent 40 years doing this, to see where we are now, it's just, it just takes my breath away. And I can't wait to see what's gonna happen in the future. But the one thing I'm really worried about and concerned about is artificial intelligence, which can both have a huge positive impact, but if it's not appropriately regulated and, and, you know, controlled, it could just have the opposite effect. So we are making sure at Meharry Medical College, we started a school of applied computational sciences that offers degrees in data science, biomedical data science, and artificial intelligence, because we want to make sure that the people doing this work are diverse. Mm-hmm. Yes. And that the biases won't be built into whatever happens. Other organizations doing the same thing. We sure. want to make sure that we're doing our part to protect the health of people going forward. And being part of the data sets is a big part of that. Well, uh, I learned a lot. And uh, I just want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be the one on the other side of the microphone and ask you these questions. You know, you've done enough that you probably could just sort of tap out and say, okay, time for the next generation. But um, you seem to still have a lot of gas in the tank still. So, um. Well, <laughs> well I, I, I do. And um, one of my first graduate students at Hopkins was a young lady from China, Margaret Guo, who brought me back a wall hanging. I don't remember his name, but he's the Shakespeare of China, so to speak. And one of the lines in the poem reads that as long as your dreams 
overshadow your memories, you're still young. And I still have some some dreams that definitely overshadow my memory, so I'm going to keep on rolling. Amen to that. No <laughs> better way to end. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you, Marcus. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Public Service Announcement. To follow along on the rest of our journey, visit www.mmc.edu. And please remember to follow, rate, and review this show wherever you get your podcasts.